My first suspicion that my wife did not deserve the trust one had always placed in her occurred to me after inviting our new neighbors into the house. Sandy and John had bought the house a year ago but had put off moving in until they completed a major renovation that included the construction of a dirt tennis court. Sarah and I were the first neighbors they invited over. We enjoyed a lovely barbecue lunch and a few nice drinks before heading out for a sightseeing tour. We lived in an affluent neighborhood, and the garden tour took some time and ended at the gorgeous tennis court. At John's invitation, Sarah and I went home to change into clothes more suitable for tennis. Ten minutes later, I had serious doubts about my wife's fidelity. Why? It was quite obvious that not only did she not know the rules of tennis, but she was also not playing well. You might think this is not a problem, but it raised a couple of questions for me. The first was, what the hell was my wife really doing when she claimed she was at tennis lessons at the country club on Friday mornings? Sarah had been taking private tennis lessons for almost a year now but apparently still hadn't even reached the beginning level. I spent the rest of the day at a loss, desperately trying to think of any reason other than the obvious why this was so. The emotional part of my brain could offer a solution, such as that perhaps she wasn't a sportswoman. Then logic put forward the counter-argument that she had a collection of trophies for soccer and netball. The scariest thing about the whole story was that Sarah seemed to take great pleasure in it, leaning over and laughing every time she made a miss or failed to hit the ball with her racket. She seemed oblivious to the doubts that plagued my head, but our hosts were not amused. Before I left, I apologized to them, saying that I had been greatly distracted by other thoughts. Well, that was true. It didn't take thousands of dollars worth of surveillance equipment or days of private investigator work to ruin my marriage. All I had to do was reschedule my appointments for the following Friday and follow my wife in a rental car. She did indeed drive to the country club. Decidedly, she headed for the athletic section, past the tennis court, and entered the building where the staff was housed. I was just in time to see her disappear into room 4B. Since I was well known at the club, I decided not to kick the door down. Instead, I went to the main administration building and spoke to the manager on duty. He grabbed a security guard, and we went back to room 4B. I didn't ask for any privacy as they quietly opened the door to the room. If Sarah was in there doing what I thought she was doing, then my marriage was over, and I didn't have to protect her from the ridicule of society. The manager on duty also felt it wasn't worth knocking since the tennis coach, who lived in the room, had to be at work. Thus, I was standing right behind the duty manager's back as he quietly inserted the lockpick. I watched as he turned his wrist. The action was almost silent, or maybe it just seemed that way to me because my heart was pounding so loudly it felt like a drum pounding in my ears. The door swung open, and I saw the room. I had my cell phone video on. It was as bad as I had imagined. Sarah was slumped over the back of the couch, her short tennis skirt pulled up to her waist, I squeezed shut in obvious ecstasy at having some young muscular asshole next to her. It made me sick to my stomach. Sick has exasperated. Oh, shit. Her eyes flew open. She saw me in my surroundings, and then she threw her head back and passed out. She looked completely ridiculous with her ass still sticking out over the back of the couch. The asshole turned away and pulled his shorts back on. The manager on duty fired his employee while I removed the wedding ring from her nerveless fingers. I'd done nothing to protect her modesty. Why bother? She didn't seem to have any modesty at all anymore. Then I grabbed the shithead by the shoulder and looked meaningfully at the manager and the guard. With a barely perceptible nod to each other, they turned away and looked in the other direction. My fist broke the young man's nose and probably his cheekbone, and my ungentlemanly knee at least helped him go soft for a week or two. He was conscious but lying on the floor. Unconscious people don't cry like that, and Sarah was in no danger of swallowing her tongue in that position, so we left the room. If Sarah and her handsome boyfriend wanted to run away together, I personally didn't care. As a couple, we were broken up. At least, that's what I thought. Admittedly, it was hard for me to give up the love I'd had for over 20 years. Sarah used this to her advantage and hit me with everything in the cheater's handbook, chapters 1 through 14. 
She felt old and worthless when a young man seduced her, blah blah blah. Damn it, blah blah. At first, she begged me not to tell our kids about it because there would be no coming back from it. For a while, I agreed. She assured me that she had never cheated before, and if I'm any judge of people, and this judgment has become hugely prevalent lately, I thought she was telling the truth. I told her that since she was 100% responsible for the breakdown of the marriage, she was also 100% responsible for fixing it. She accepted the challenge, and I have to say I was secretly hoping she would convince me to forgive what she assured me was her first breach of marital fidelity. Yeah, that damn love tap that never wanted to close. Besides, everything she was saying gave me an uncomfortable feeling in the back of my head. Would I have the strength to resist if a beautiful girl who was 20 years younger than me tried to seduce me? I hope the answer would be in the affirmative, but who knows? After a little thought, she asked me what it would take for me to forgive her. I gave her an impossible goal. She'd have to break up with that asshole, erase from my memory everything I knew about her affair, and erase the tape of her leaning over his couch. In other words, I hadn't given her what I thought was a chance. After I kicked her out of our marital bed and packed her things, the house was a complete mess until the following weekend. Sarah's actions showed that my open search for another place to live had left her even more desperate. Nothing. Friday night, she told me she was going to visit her best friend, Julia. She gave me Julia's home phone number and offered to call it whenever I wanted to prove she was where she said she was. I could even talk to Julia's husband, Jake, whom I knew well. Of course, I didn't bother. She might have done some stupid things lately, but she wasn't weak-minded. It was well past 11 o'clock in the evening when Sarah burst into the marital bedroom, literally shaking with excitement. She and Julia had a fantastic idea, an idea that completely met all of my requirements. I quickly put myself on full alert and listened with a heart that unconsciously but desperately wanted to find an excuse to forgive her. She suggested that, for one thing, I should be allowed to have sex with another woman once a week for a year. It would kill her that I was doing it, but I could be sure that the pain would allow her never to go astray again. She hissed at me when I interrupted her, telling her that no good could come out of two wrongs and I wasn't that kind of guy. But she begged me to hear it all the way through. Julia had a friend who went to a hypnotherapist in our small town to deal with her fear of spiders. Apparently, she was completely cured. Sarah and Julia asked Dr. Google to see if memories could be erased and received an unequivocal positive answer if the patient wanted to do so. She begged me with tears in her eyes to think about it, and if I agreed, she would contact a hypnotherapist as soon as possible. I promised to think about it if she would leave me alone. Well, as you can imagine, I got very little sleep that night. This idea seemed to give me the excuse I'd been waiting for. I was sure that the whole experience had scared Sarah enough that she would never break her vows again. Her plan also met the criteria I had set for her. I challenged her, and she seemed to accept it. Going through the therapy she suggested would allow her to get rid of the boyfriend, at least in my mind. It would, of course, erase memories that I otherwise just couldn't forget. In the morning, I sat down at the conference table with my calm, confident wife. I explained that under no circumstances would I sleep with another woman. Sarah seemed a little worried about this until I ended my tirade by saying that I would cooperate fully with a hypnotherapist who would withhold my knowledge of her affair on one condition. She had to assure me once again that she would not use my newly erased mind to cheat in the future, nor would she use her recent experience to be more careful not to get caught next time. She cried when she saw this further evidence of my distrust of her but recovered enough to convince me that it was impossible. This whole episode had scared her to the core, and there was absolutely no way she would jeopardize a relationship that was on the brink of disaster. She will never hurt me again. She loves me. When I was satisfied, she wanted to pull me into the bedroom to seal the deal, but I just wasn't ready for that. I asked if she had been tested for STDs, and my heart was relieved. Fortunately for us, the following Wednesday afternoon, the hypnotherapist had a cancelled appointment, and Sarah took advantage of that. 
We agreed that I would leave for work early and Sarah would stay home to remove any evidence that she had slept in the spare room and any other evidence that my mind had recently cleared of bad memories. We agreed to meet at the practitioner's office at 3 p.m. As usual, I arrived 15 minutes early. I walked into the clinic and said hello to the receptionist. She let me fill out a new patient questionnaire. It was a little after 3 when Sarah burst into the office. I had just returned the form and sat down at the desk. She looked a little annoyed, complaining loudly about the accident that had caused the direct route she was trying to take to be closed. At the end of this denunciation, the secretary said politely, come in, and pointed to the door in the reception area. Sarah was already up, so she made her way to said door and knocked before turning the doorknob and crossing the threshold. I got up and followed her but was halfway across the reception area when I heard an unfamiliar voice, surprisingly loud and raspy for a woman. Hello again, Mrs. Brown. Have you lost weight? I froze, and in the silence that followed, the receptionist called out to me, you must have been here before, Mr. Brown. We already have your information in the computer. As the hypnotist's loud words and the secretary's innocent remark penetrated my shocked brain, Sarah turned around abruptly, and I found myself looking directly into the eyes of my so-called loving wife of 23 years. She was unnaturally pale, and panic was red in her eyes. She quickly lowered her gaze to the floor when she saw me looking at her. I took a deep breath as the true story of our recent past regained its inevitable shape in my mind. All the pieces of the mosaic came together on their own. The picture, it turned out, was ugly. There was no more doubt. My once idyllic life had been shattered. I realized now that it had happened a second time. I'd always considered my wife to be intellectually equal to me, but recently she had done some really stupid things. Or was it overconfidence? Whatever the case, by acting this way, she has ruined our lives, and many will feel it for themselves. We both stood frozen in place for what seemed like an eternity. Each of us, I think, was gripped by an inner terror. But time was unstoppable. In fact, it seemed to be moving forward and fast forward as Sarah ran out of the room as if she were being chased by a demon. As she ran past, she shoved my shoulder with such force that I spun full circle, stumbled, and collapsed onto one of the chairs in the reception area. My words were screwed bitch as she fled. Jane, as the hypnotist was called, sat next to me, her voice calm and gentle as she explained that she was offended when Sarah approached her a second time. Confidentiality forbade her from telling me that I had been duped again, so she devised a way to bring me up to speed by seating another receptionist in the reception area and loudly greeting Sarah. The method was subtle and depended on my powers of observation, but it formally honored all the rules of confidentiality. I thanked her warmly for her honesty. In the hour allotted, she played the role of counselor and friend. Perhaps because she already knew so much about me, it was easy for me to talk to her. At the end of the hour, we stood up. Jane smiled and shook my hand, telling me that she was sure I was calm enough to drive a car without endangering others on the road. She recommended that I contact a friend to be with me. As she walked me to the door, she said, I bet you're glad you have everything prearranged. That stopped me. What's prearranged? We went back and took our seats again. It turned out that the I who had come for my first treatment with her a little over a year ago had made Sarah sign a postnuptial agreement as a condition of attending a hypnotherapy session. I was clearly much smarter then than I am now. The gratitude I felt for Jane quadrupled, and I asked how I could thank her. Her answer surprised the hell out of me. Apparently, she had two receptionists. The other, Sandra, had been on duty during my first visit and was bemoaning the fact that my therapy had been successful, lamenting that all the good men are already taken. Sandra was about a year younger than me and had gotten out of an abusive marriage two years earlier. She didn't trust other men, let alone life. Jane made me promise that I would go on a date with Sandra when things settled down. I happily agreed. By the time I got home, it looked like a tornado had swept through the house. Most of Sarah's things were gone. Papers were strewn everywhere. I searched but couldn't find anything resembling what was written in the post-nuptial agreement. 
I had to call all the local law firms to see if I was a client of theirs, but I forgot about it. I was just cleaning the house and throwing Sarah's remaining belongings into the garage when the phone rang. It was my daughter asking what the hell was going on. Sarah, wanting to get in first, made up a story that I had agreed to let her sleep with other men, even watched her sometimes, but it changed my mind and was now punishing her. I exploded, and my daughter, seized with anger, quickly became convinced that I was telling the truth. Fortunately, the fact that I was a cuckold she didn't believe from the beginning. I called my son to make sure his mother had told him the same false story, and he too had a change of heart. Sarah's lies to the children only increased my anger. With an all-consuming rage bubbling in my veins, I wrote an email to her parents, brother, sisters, all of our friends and colleagues in charity work, to every damn email address I could find. In the email, I told them that I knew what Sarah had said about me, that it was her lie, and here was a transcript of her reaction to being caught having sex with her tennis coach. I also outlined the hypnotherapist's story to properly expose Sarah as a serial libertine and a vicious slut. I received many supportive responses. Shortly before midnight, I received a phone call from Sarah. She was yelling something incoherently, but I was able to understand from her mumbling that both kids, parents, and many of our friends had called to disown her. Toward the end, she calmed down enough to resort to threats. Contact everyone you sent that email to and retract it, or I will destroy everything you hold dear. You've already done that, I replied, letting her know that she no longer had power over me. This set off a sobbing fit that was interspersed with apologies one moment and threats to send me to the dry cleaners the next. The next day, a copy of the postnuptial contract ended up in my mailbox. There it was, written in plain language, signed and notarized. Sarah must have been desperate the first time because she was handing me pretty much everything if I could prove adultery after a certain point. I called a lawyer and began preparations to divorce and got my ex-wife. By the time the divorce was finalized and the bailiffs tracked Sarah down to collect what was left of her personal jewelry, most of it she had sold to feed herself, I had heard from various sources that she had reached out to old friends for support, but all doors had closed in her face. The last I heard of her from my daughter was that Sarah was living off the funds of one of the charities she used to help run. Shortly after that, she disappeared without a trace. My daughter still gets a card every birthday with no return address on it. As for me, I did go on a date with Sandra, a date followed by another date, and then another, and another, and another. You get the picture. We were both very reluctant to open our hearts at first, but eventually, we got married. Jane was a bridesmaid, and we are now living happily ever after.